Um, hello, welcome to uh, the SOFO sessions. Um, this is session number five. It is uh, transfer function part one. Can you give me that, that slide back for a second? I want to see the screen. Okay, so uh, it's, I want to, it's transfer function part one. Um, th this is kind of uh, important, guys. Um, this is going to be about four parts to get through transfer function. It's probably why you're here is learning the transfer function measurement, um, subtitled Tale of Two Signals. Um, but I want to make this part clear. This is part one of four. Um, we're not even going to get to reading phase or, or, or the phase trace or anything like that until uh, until section the the third part of this so that's gonna be next week um, when we get there so just keep that in mind we're taking about a six hour eight hour portion of class and we're condensing it into four uh, one hour sessions so just be aware of that we're not we're gonna spend most of the day is gonna be in PowerPoint mania um, and then uh, most of the next session is we're going to go through and we're going to talk about the magnitude response um, and the coherence measurement. Um, and we're going to be looking at, uh, at the actual live measurements. And then by the time we get to, to the, uh, the third session in this, in this, the part three of it, that will be when we touch on phase. I'm just warning you right now. I'm sure people are going to keep asking, um, but... Just be aware of that. Again, presenter, I'm Jamie Anderson, and uh, we have Chris Tanjouris, uh, who's doing some of the presentation. Uh, tomorrow, Michael is going to be, uh, not tomorrow, Friday, so in two days, he's going to be doing a presentation on SPL. Um, right now, he's uh, my my wingman here running the uh, running the production here. And of course, Gavin Kanan, who is our training coordinator. Um, again, I can't say this enough, the email address that you want, if you have questions, if you have problems, any, support at rationalacoustics.com. We've got a whole team of people that are going to triage that, get it to the right person to answer your questions. Support at rationalacoustics.com. If you want to talk about training stuff, training at rationalacoustics.com. Um, sales, of course, for, for sales stuff. But if you don't know, send it to support. Okay, so what are we going to cover in this session? Well, we're going to talk about why a dual channel me measurement. Why? Are, what's so uh, cool about a dual channel measurement? Um, we're going to talk about the transfer function system response measurement, both in uh, frequency domain and time domain. Um, so the impulse response and frequency response. Um, we're going to talk about some general issues here. Um, we're going to talk about system latency. Um, we're going to talk about the FFTs we use and, and multi-time window, our default uh, FFT settings. We'll talk about linear systems. We'll talk about noise, all these things that affect our measurement. Um, we're going to talk about um, the coherence trace. Call coherence trace your measurement wingman because that trace um, is one of the few places in SMART that's going to warn you if you're messing up your measurement or if there's something critically wrong with your system or something. So um, this will become your best friend when you're taking transfer function measurements. And then the last thing we're going to end with today is just configuring a measurement and just walk through the whole configuration process. So we're not going to do a ton of work on the analyzer today, um, although we will we'll start off with a quick measurement. I want to, I want to show you guys something. Um, so we'll jump on over. So let's remember that our basic measurement model, um, we put a signal into a system, we get a signal out of the system. Now that system can be anything. It could be a, a piece of wire. It could be a DSP device. It could be a complex multi-channel system in a, in a really chaotic or creative uh, acoustic environment. But basically the way that we measure it is we put a signal into that system, we get a signal out, um, in the case of the electroacoustic measurement, the output we would be monitoring at a microphone. Um, so this gives us the, our two different types of measurement. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over here into, into our measurements. Now, I always start up by just verifying my signals. That's step one when you're getting on the analyzer is just verifying that the signals are what you thought. Now, what I'm going to do is I just want to show you something um, to get you guys thinking, but I'm going to jump over. I have a little setup here. 
Um, now, one of the first ways people learn to tune a system, the classic, is just with um, with pink noise and a uh, with with pink noise and a um, a uh, I'm just getting the the dynamic range set right here. So we send pink noise into the system, which is nice and flat. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, unmute the the system and. <laughs> I'm crapping at all this different equipment. Um, and I will look at this microphone. And so what we're going to see is that pink noise on an RTA looks flat. And so we're sending noise in. One of the classic ways of tuning a system is sending pink noise through the system, looking at a measurement mic, and looking at the spectrum showing up there. And there, wherever there's bumps in that or dips, um, you say, okay, that's what the system is doing to the signal passing through it. And so this is a classic way uh, that people often learn to tune a system. So I'm going to show you this. Um, I turned off the generator, I believe. And we'll, we'll do the classic look. We'll do a third octave RTA. And you can see it's mostly flat. Um, so the next thing that I'm going to do is um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on a transfer function measurement. And so the transfer function measurement is what we're going to spend our time on here. But keep in mind, when you're using an analyzer, it's all about asking questions. So if the question that you're asking in this case is, what is the tonal response of the system? What is the magnitude response of the system? Then you're going to be surprised um, that the RTA actually can give you some good information with pink noise and looking at an RTA. It gets a bad rap because, well, I'll point out why it gets a bad rap. But I just wanted to show you something interesting here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the spectrum up here. And uh, here's an interesting thing. I have a, a magnitude response, which is a transfer function measurement. And then on top, I have uh, RTA, which is a spectrum measurement. And so the control bar is show is right now, the magnitude response has focus. And so the control bar and the data bar match what plot has focus. I'm going to click on the top window. Now it has focus. And I'm going to go into my spectrum measurement here. And I'm going to say, OK, first, let's graph this as a line. I'll go ahead and hit apply, hit OK. The next thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put in some averaging here. So I want to look at the average spectrum. I'll give it a good deal of averaging. I'll turn on the noise. And then the last thing I'm going to I'll move this to 48th octave resolution. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'll put the vertical scale more akin to uh, and I'll turn off some noise here. So, OK, so now I set the vertical scale of the spectrum with the same vertical scale, approximate third vertical scale. So the, the magnitude trace is showing plus and minus uh, 18 dB. So I set that with the same 36 dB uh, vertical scale range on the spectrum, did an average. And I think when you look at these two, they seem to be saying a lot of the same information. Right. And so they are telling us they're both telling us about that tonal response of the system. OK, so the question comes in. Um, question comes in here, then why dual channel? I mean, that it, they both seem to give me the same answer. So so what's up here, guys? Well, here's the thing about the, the dual channel measurement as opposed to the single channel measurement. A single channel measurement is just telling you what's showing up at that microphone. So we're putting in flat noise, and we're expecting that whatever's showing up here is the result of whatever happened to it as, it as it went through the system. The thing about that single channel measurement is it's just telling you how much 1K is showing up at this microphone. It looks like we're measuring with a SM58 here. But so what is saying how much 1K is showing up, or how much 10K, or how much 100 cycles is showing up? But it, do, it doesn't have a reference. So it can't tell you if what's showing up there is direct sound, if it's reflected sound, if it's noise, if it's air handling noise and has nothing to do with the signal sent through. Uh, imagine if I took the speaker that I was measuring right there 
And what I did was I uh, delayed the high driver in that speaker 100 milliseconds. I could get it nice and flat spectrally on the, on the um, RTA, but if I listened to that system, it would sound pretty whacked out with the high end delayed from the low end. So the dual channel measurement is a system response measurement. So it knows what was sent into the system and it can look at what happened to that signal as it passed through it. It can say, how long did it take for that signal to get through the system? Did multiples of the signal show up on output, reflections or reverberance? Um, it's going to tell me what's showing up at the output that actually isn't related to the input. So it's going to tell us about noise in our, our system. So while the spectrum measurement is a, is a useful measurement, it's good to telling us about the energy present there. The dual channel measurement is really the meat and potatoes of system engineering work because it's going to tell us, it's going to give us a lot more information. If I jump back over to the measurement that I have right there and I actually go to the transfer function view and I go ahead and show the live IR. So let me. So what I have here in my transfer function measurement is I have the impulse response. So I have the time response to the system. You see a little bit of crap that showed up. <laughs> my measurement blew up. We're going to talk about that later. But basically, um, we've got the, the magnitude response, which is telling us about the tonality of the system. We've got the phase response that's telling us about the timing of the energy going through the system and whether or not there were polarity inversions. And we've got our friend the coherence trace, that red trace, which is telling us about transmission quality. So what we're going to spend our time today is let's talk about all this stuff in general, generally concentrating on some uh, some general concepts here. Um, and then what we'll see uh, in the next uh, the, the next part of this is we'll actually go through and do a bunch of measurements. And just to warn you, um, it might be worth you setting up your measurements to measure along um, next time we do this. OK, so. Our, our system response, we call this the transfer function. Basically, it's the response of the system. The response of the system in frequency domain, so by frequency, we call that the frequency response. And so what we have is the magnitude response. So the magnitude response is just in versus out and level. So for every single frequency, so frequency is going along the horizontal axis. So it's just telling us, so if this is in to this is out, it's saying, did I get more out, did I get less out, or did I get the same out? So it's, it's expressed in dB, basically gain or loss versus frequency. So if it's above the line, it's plus dB, it's showing me gain. Below the line, it's showing me loss. And so it's gain and loss versus frequency. Up in the top, there's the phase trace. We'll get into that in a, in a couple episodes later. Um, but it's telling us about how the signal was smeared out in time. So magnitude's telling us how it was affected in level and tonality. The top one's telling us about how it was smeared out in time and polarity. Um, and then the last guy here, the red trace, is actually sort of a meta measurement because it's a measurement of the measurement. It's telling us about uh, measurement stability. And so we're going to dig into, we'll dig into that today. Now the lower guy, what we've got is we've got the, uh, the impulse response. So it's telling us, it's looking and saying, how long did it take for the signal to get through the system? And then did multiples of the signal show up on output? Now with like what we did with the spectrograph yesterday or the last, last thing, being able to look at the same data multiple ways is a pretty powerful thing. So here, we can look at that with a linear scale or with a log scale. With the logarithmic scale, it tends to blow up the, the vertical scale. So stuff that's lower down in level shows up a lot better on the, the logarithmic scale. And the logarithmic scale, either ETC view or log view. Um, so if, if what you're looking for is what's happening acoustically in the room, reflections, reverberance, um, that stuff shows up much better in the logarithmic view. In the linear view, um, the good thing about the linear view is it's showing you the full oscillogram. So the log view is absolute value. In the linear view, you can see polarity inversion. So if I reverse the polarity, I'd see that impulse response flip upside down. The thing ab about the, the linear view, though, is it's really focused on the loudest high frequency arrival. So imagine if we had a reflection coming in uh, 12 dB down. That's, that's a quarter power of a quarter power. Um, so the size of that impulse, a 12 dB down reflection, which is still a significant reflection, um, 
is going to be 1 16th the size in a linear scale. This right here um, is, is a, a reflection that's coming in at 6 dB down, and it's already pretty well suppressed. And so that reverberance shows up as a little bit of wiggle in your trace. So if you're looking, if your question is what's going on acoustically, the logarithmic view of the impulse response is probably more what you're looking for. Um, one of the first places we're going to run into the impulse response, and you saw that in my measurement, was we had the, the live impulse response because one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to use the impulse response to measure the latency through the system and set that for our measurement. So we'll get back onto that as we go. Okay, so this is just the basic concept. We grab the signal going in, we grab the signal coming out, so we grab a chunk of uh, a buffer. So if, I if it was a 16K FFT, that would be about a 341 millisecond chunk of wave. So we grab it on input, we grab it on output, we run it through, we get the complex spectra, so we get the, the spectrum of the reference signal, we get the spectrum of the measurement signal. Now here's the cool thing, and then we, with the transfer function, we find the difference between the two. We find not the difference like subtracting one from the other, but the, the, how they're different from each other. But basically, what we're seeing here is we're seeing, okay, I put in flat noise, I get a dip, I get a peak. Now that's kind of what we just did with putting in pink noise and looking at RTA. The cool thing with the transfer function measurement though is it doesn't matter what you're sending through the system, all we're seeing is a difference from when it went in to when it came out. So that, if you imagine that I was listening to the output of the system, so the measurement that best correlates with our listening mechanism, of course, is the RTA. And so you look down here, this is what I would be hearing. That certainly sounds different than that, sounds different than that. Although the transfer function is just telling me what the system is doing to the signal passing through it. And in this case, it was the same in each case. Now, one of the things we do in our measurements, we kind of try and protect ourselves from ourselves. So um, there are a lot of things that are built into our measurement that try and get rid of bad data. And so one of those places, one of those things that we do when we're taking our measurements is, the, and one of the first things we do is we look at the reference signal and we say, did we send in enough level at a given frequency? If I didn't send in anything at a given frequency, why am I calculating a transfer function? I don't, if I didn't put, send anything in, why am I looking at what I'm getting out? Now, that, the question I always ask is, can you, can you measure a subwoofer with flute music, right? And so the cool thing about this dual channel measurement is that we can measure with whatever's going through the system, which means that we can measure with music or voice or whatever's going through the system. But one of the things we do immediately is we gate our measurements. So we only use data where we actually had excitation signals. So it's one of the ways that we improve our data quality. Um, okay, so what we see here, the, oh, another, another way of thresholding our data is just with overload. So if I overload my input or overload my output, again, I won't use that data until I clear the overload condition. Again, how can we get good data if we have crappy signals or if we're overloading our input signals. So this is something that we do. Any place we can protect ourselves really from ourselves, we're gonna do it. Um, and so uh, what we've got going here, that's, this is the basic process of our, of our, our transfer function measurement here. Um, the, the thing is, I like to be able to measure and say be listening to music. The thing is though with music is it's not necessarily are always spectrally dense. It can be quite sparse. Or if you're just talking with voice or something like that, all it means is to do those measurements then, it's gonna take us longer. One of the reasons why we use uh, pink noise is because we're exciting at all the frequencies. It's got all the frequencies there. It's got a low crest factor, meaning it's average to peak ratio. It's a very sort of, it's, it's not really dynamic. Um, so it's got a, a peak to average ratio of 12, 8 to 12 dB, whereas when you're talking about voice and speech, that can be upwards anywhere from 12 to 24 dB. So while um, there isn't necessarily a benefit to have using pink noise versus, versus music or whatever, the thing is that pink noise is a very efficient measurement signal for us to, to be using because we're exciting all the frequencies there and it's not aggressively dynamic. 
Um, so one of the questions is going to come in. We're asking ourselves, how can we measure? How can we measure the time response or the echoic response of the system? Like the impulse response is kind of telling us, right? It's a we put in an impulse. How long does it take for that impulse to get to the listening position? And do multiples of that impulse show up on the output as reflections and reverberates? Um, well, the thing is, and this is one of the cool things about transforms and inverse transforms, when we derive the, the transfer function, the, the frequency response, the magnitude and phase, this data is the frequency domain view of the data. We can just apply an IFT, an inverse transform, and get the time domain view. So this is just two views of the same information. I mean, that's, that's a pretty powerful thing. Literally, and this is a proper use of the word liter literally, um, is that the data here is the exact same data. So this data, the impulse response data, and the, the frequency response data is just two views of the same data. Um, in this case, what we're seeing down here, this animal is a, a comb filter, right? So you've got a peak at 2K, peak at 4K, peak at 6K, peak at 8K. So this is a two kilohertz comb. So we see a peak every two kilohertz. It's gonna be linearly spaced. That comb filter is caused by adding a second arrival of a signal one over the comb filter frequency, so one over 2K is a half millisecond. If we look at this data in time domain, we see the initial arrival and then a second arrival a half millisecond later. Now imagine how that's going to affect your decision making here. You see a, you see a, a curve like this and maybe you're tempted to go in and put in a boost and a cut and a boost and a cut and a boost. And a cut. I hope you're not. but. You see that if you look at time domain, you realize, oh, this is this is not something I should be going after with EQ. This is a timing issue. I should I should clean it up there. Um, but the cool thing is, it says we can measure we can um, measure the the frequency response with constant pink noise going through the system and derive the echoic response of the system from there. And one of the things we've done since we started version seven 10 years ago is that whenever we calculate this, whenever we calculate the frequency response, we calculate the impulse response at the same time. That's what you saw in my measurement before was we had the frequency response down low and the little window up on top was the impulse response, so the time response of the system. Okay, so this is the whole basic process. We put a signal into the system, we grab the signal going in, we call that the reference signal. Um, we grab that signal, we grab the signal coming out of the system, we call that the measurement signal. Uh, we take those two signals, we run them through an FFT and get the complex spectra of the signals. We then do the transfer function, we compare those two, and we get the, the, the frequency response. Then we run an IFT to get the impulse response. So we've got single channel time domain, single channel frequency domain, dual channel uh, frequency domain, dual channel time domain. So this is signal analysis, this is signal response, this is system response. So that's what we're involved in. Now, when you hit run on, a, on an engine in Smart, what Smart's gonna do is it's gonna do this whole process and then a 24th of a second later, it's gonna do it again and it's gonna do it again and it's gonna do it again. So when you hit run, Smart's going to just start going in and calculating measurement after measurement after measurement, and we're going to average those measurements together, and we'll talk about why we're averaging them. But as soon as you hit run, that's what's going on. It's acquiring what went in, what came out, comparing them. Okay, now I kind of oversimplified it just in that statement right there, because basically we're sending a signal through the system, but it's going to take some time to go through the system unless that unless that system is just bare wire. Basically speaking, the measurement signal is going to arrive at some time later. So when we compare the reference signal to the measurement signal, one of the things we're going to want to do is delay that reference signal to put it in time with the measurement signal. So what we want to do, the, in, the first thing we want to do in our transfer function measurement is measure the response, the, the latency through the system we're measuring and then apply that delay. And you can see that delay, it's in a transfer function engine, you see we have measurement signal, reference signal, and what we see down here is the delay applied to get those two in time. 
So what we're looking for um, is correlation. We're basically capturing a wave and then we're on input and then we're looking to see how long does it take for that wave to show up on output and do multiples of that wave show up. And so I, I call this the, the, the TF correlation window. Basically, what I, as just a rule of thumb, I use a third of the time constant of the FFT. And so, again, we talked about time constant before. If I was using a 304, uh, excuse me, a, a 16K FFT, 16,000 samples at 48,000 samples per second, you do the math, it's 341 milliseconds. So a third of that time constant is somewhere around 100, 110 milliseconds. Um, so basically, when we compare these to the reference to the measurement, we want them to be uh, within a third of a time constant of each other. So if, if there is so much delay through the system that when I'm comparing my reference, it's off from the measurement signal, and the measurement signal is off from the reference signal by more than a third of that time constant, we're not going to get a good correlation. And as that time offset gets greater and greater, we're going to get worse and worse correlation till even two thirds out, you really won't be able to correlate the reference signal to the measurement signal. So what this means is when it comes time to measure our delays, like that's the first step in the transfer function measurement. When it comes to taking that measurement, we want to be using an FFT size for our impulse response measurement, for our delay finding measurement, that's at least three times the delay offset we're looking for. So when once we're within about a third of a time constant, you can see we're only off by about, I don't know, sixth of a time constant, we're gonna get pretty good correlation. The first thing we wanna do is get the best correlation we can possible. So we wanna delay the reference signal to the direct arrival um, in the measurement signal. Um, now, it is going to be possible with our measurements where we could, we could put in too much delay. So we actually have too much delay on the reference signal. And so effectively in our measurement, our, our measurement signal is arriving before the reference signal. We've added too much delay. A classic example of this is I go put a microphone out in the room. Let's say I'm 20 milliseconds away from the loudspeaker. I set my delay. Then I pick, pick up my microphone and I move it closer to the, uh, to the speaker. Now I've shortened the effective latency through the system because a lot of that latency has to do with the travel of, of the signal through air. Uh, sound travels about uh, a foot per millisecond or 34 centimeters per millisecond. Um, and so as I move the microphone closer to the speaker, now I have a situation in my measurement where I've, I've got excess delay on my reference signal. As long as that reference signal is still within a third of that time constant, you're gonna be good for finding that delay again. Um, so we're gonna use that correlation window is gonna come into play in a couple places. Okay, so let's talk about our basic FFT settings that we're gonna be using in SMART. Now, um, it is possible to just use a single FFT. So we could use a 16K, a 32K, whatever you want to use. But what our goal here is, is we want a measurement that corresponds with our listening mechanism. If what you can see with these different FFTs is that if I use a really short FFT, I get decent resolution up top, but I, my resolution, because it's linear, I basically run out of resolution down low. Um, what I want is we're trying to take measurements that correlate with human listening. So I want good resolution, constant 48th octave or 24th octave resolution across the 20, and 20 to 20 K um, spectrum. And so the thing is that, that I want to get decent resolution down low. Well, to get decent resolution down low, I need a really big time constant, but if I use something, this right here, this FFT, um, the lower one, that is a 32K FFT. The 32K FFT, you don't need to know these numbers, but the 32K FFT is gonna return 16,000 complex data points, but they're linearly spaced. So if they're linearly spaced, half of the points are from 10K to 20K. So there's 8,000 data points up here between 10K and 20K. Now I don't need 8,000th of an octave resolution up there but the reason why we used the big time constant was to get a good resolution down low. Now, when people 
started doing that. And when Smart came out in 95, um, it was running on, you know, 486 computers with 16 megs of RAM. And, you know, basically these processors were pretty challenged. So even though it could run the FFT in real time, the, the concept of running a 32K FFT in real time was, was pretty challenging, if not uh, impossible. Um, and so the thing was that we had to find a way of doing a large, using, getting a large time constant, but not doing it by using a huge FFT. Now the people that pioneered this were, were Meyer with SIM, the process that we kind of use, which is using decimation. So there's two ways to get a larger and larger time constant. You don't have to know this. <laughs> it's just, but this is, it's a useful thing to, it's, it's kind of cool if you're a geek. But basically, there's two ways to get a bigger time constant. The one way to get a bigger time constant is to just increase the size of the FFT. So you go from a 1K to a 2K to a 4K to an 8K to a 16K. Cool. Except that I already said that at the time, that wasn't really possible. So instead, what we're going to do to get the big time constant is instead of increasing the size of the FFT, we're going to drop the sample rate. So imagine if I had a 3,000 point FFT. I'm just doing this so the numbers line up really easily. And I'm sampling at 48K. So 3,000 samples at 48,000 samples per second is a 16th of a second. If I then drop the sample rate, cut the sample rate in half, and cut it to 24K, then 3,000 samples at 24,000 samples per second ends up being an eighth of a second. And then I, if I drop my sample rate again, um, then we're at 12K. And so 3,000 samples at 12,000 samples uh, per second ends up being a quarter of a second. Go down to six, you decimate again to, to 6,000. Now it's a half second. And if we drop the sample rate all the way down to 3,000 samples per second, 3,000 samples at 3,000 samples per second gives you a time constant of, of a whole second. Um, so the frequency resolution there my f would be one hertz. I'd get a, I'd get a measurement because my frequency resolution equals one over the size of my time constant. So if my time constant is one second, I'm going to get a data point every hertz. So what we see here in this is view up here is you see it, in the high frequency, this gives me a decent resolution up there. I like that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to run a bunch of FFTs, not just one FFTs, but multiple FFTs of longer and longer time constants. Now, the thing is, we know because we know digital audio that when I drop my sample rate, I'm also dropping Nyquist, which is the highest frequency you, you can measure. But I'm not too worried about that because the reason why I'm dropping the sample rate is to get better res resolution lower and lower. So as long as the data I'm looking for is down below um, below Nyquist or 80% of Nyquist, um, I'll be in good shape. So effectively speaking, you don't have to remember any of that, um, but this was an efficient way to keep running small FFTs, but get large time constants in order to get data that was much more of a constant resolution. So I'm just showing you, we kind of stole out the, the different parts of, of the different sized FFTs. So my whole point here is, the thing you should take away from this is just in the high frequencies with the multi-time window, in the high frequencies we're very, using very short time constants, and then as you go down lower, we're using progressively longer and longer time constants. So if we look at our data here, um, and we're going to do something, we have, I haven't shown this before, but what I'm going to show you is where, we're, where our FFTs are, are breaking. So up at the very top, we have above 9.5K or thereabouts. Um, we're using a very short FFT. Um, if you want to figure out what the time constants are, then you can do the math. Because what you can do is figure out the distance between the spacings. So there's going to be an even amount of spacing between each data point. Just find that and go one over. And it'll tell you what the time constants are. But you, you should figure it out for yourselves. But basically, what we have is we're running six of them. So we have one up above 9.5. We've got another above 1.8. So this is a longer time constant, longer time constant, longer, longer. And by the time we get down to the very bottom, we're at almost a full second worth of a time constant. And so, but you can see that we, using that data, produces a pretty consistent, almost 48 points per octave resolution as we go up from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So our default in SMART 
is instead of trying to optimize the FFT size, MTW does that for you. So it uses a small one at top and a longer one down below. Okay, so we hit a point here um, at when, we, when we started up Rational Acoustics. We had an opportunity to rebuild Smart from the ground up. So 12 years ago, we looked at it and, and we had made the decision to do the multi-time window. We called it FPPO in the earlier versions of Smart, which meant fixed point per octave, but basically the same concept. Um, and so we had the, the, a gut checkpoint there. We said, well, do we still need to do this multi-time window thing? Because we can now run a 32K FFT in real time, no problem. Right. And so um, what we what how we came in, we basically had a question here and we answered our question with a question. Are reflections signal or noise? Right. And the answer to that, of course, is yes or no or it depends. Right. There's so many answers that it, it, to the questions we ask that it it depends. A reflection that's coming in early, we rely on early reflections to to give us extra signal. Your early lateral reflections or early, you, you'll be sitting there and you'll be having signal bouncing off the desk in front of you. Or if you have close in walls, the energy bouncing off the walls is coming in late, but it's adding in and it's, it's your ears are actually using that and it, it seems coherent and it's useful. The problem comes in as those reflections get later and later, they go from helpful to hurtful, useful to detrimental. One of the biggest uh, indicators of, of intelligibility and usability is early to late arriving energy ratios. So as energy is coming back later and later, it goes from helpful to hurtful, useful to detrimental. Um, and so that's one of the things that, that happens. If, you, if you're doing gigs or you're doing shows in a very small environment, um, then having highly reflective walls might help with intelligibility. You blow that up to a much larger room, and so now the reflections are not coming back off the walls 10 milliseconds later or 20 milliseconds later. They're coming back 30, 40, 50 milliseconds later. All of a sudden, you end up with a, a situation where those reflections that were helping before are hurting you now. So we wanted to use that. So we said, well, actually, those time constants, that correlation window is actually useful for us. A 32K FFT has a time constant of 683 milliseconds at a 48K sample rate. So two thirds of a second. So if you think about that correlation window as being one third of that window, um, that means 200 stuff that's arriving even 200 milliseconds late is still within that correlation window. So what I have here on the slide is a basic idea of a model of, of what's going in our system. So we, we send a signal into the system. Here's the time response of the system. So it takes amount of time to get to the listening position. And then we have the signal appearing multiple times. We have some reflections, we have reverberance, and we have later and later arriving copies. So if we look at this, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set our delay. So we're going to delay our reference signal to the direct arrival. That's the most important guy. We want the best mathematical correlation. These later reflections, though, coming in are going to be arrive later and later relative to the reference signal. So the early arriving reflections are still going to mathematically correlate, whereas you get to later and later reflections, they kind of go from impacting our measurement as signal to impacting it as noise. So that, that's gonna play a very important little, little part in what we're doing. Well, I'm gonna put that aside for right now, but the basic idea is that the size of the time constants that we're using is gonna have an impact on how later arriving energy is gonna impact our measurement, whether it's gonna be classified as signal or noise, friend or foe. Okay, so a couple things I wanna talk about is just in general, okay. Um, linearity in our systems. Okay, there are some people out there that are going to freak out when I say this, but, but bear with me. The systems that we're using, the rooms that we're, we're measuring in, they're linear systems. What do we mean by linear or linear time invariant is, does the response change with excitation level? Does the response change over time? So 
if I measure the system at 90 dBSPL and then I measure it at 100 dBSPL and then I measure it at, at 110, does the system response change with drive level? Um, and does the room's response change with drive level? Um, the, now, the answer is going to basically be no. That Now, the thing, one of the things you, you have to understand here is that there are all sorts of nonlinearities in our system, like harmonic distortion. There's, there's some little type of stuff. If you really start driving a system, um, a classic nonlinear system is a compressor, right? Oftentimes, we use compressors to, to protect us from the worst nonlinearity, which is clipping, right? So we, as you as you cross over a threshold in a compressor, its job is it starts turning the gain down so it keeps you from slamming into that hard clip. But basically, when we're measuring our, our speaker systems, they're going to measure linear, meaning that we measure them at a low level, we measure them at a high level, they should measure exactly the same. Now you can say, bullshit, excuse me. Um, you don't, have to, you don't have to trust me on this. The reason why you have an analyzer um, is so you can test this stuff. That's why you're getting an analyzer is so you can answer your own questions. And so the thing is that what we should see is as we measure louder and louder, with our, our system's gonna stay linear. So I'm gonna get the same response at, when I measure at a low level as a high level. Same thing, same thing is true with our rooms that we're measuring in, that we get, we're gonna get the same response at a low level than a high level. Now there is one, there is one, well, we're gonna get the same response until we hit nonlinearity where we hit power compression or where we hit, um, where we hit uh, the compressors that are there to, to protect the system. Um, but this is a good thing because what this means is I don't have to measure the system at show level I can measure it, I just need to measure it loud enough to be able to get a solid measurement. We'll talk about how to do that. But that's, we're, we're kind of happy about that because now I don't have to blow out everybody's ears listening to noise at really high levels. Um, the thing is that there is one system involved in all of our systems that is nonlinear, markedly nonlinear, and that's our listening mechanism. If you look at loudness curves, um, this, this is going to be touched on on Friday when we're talking about SPL. The human perceptual mechanism is going to change its response with level. So as you go up, the perceived tonal response is going to change. That means that when it comes to listening to a system to see if it sounds right for the program material, you are going to have to bring it up to a level that's within the, the level that you're gonna be using the system within 6 dB or something in there just to get an, an idea of, of the listening. The other thing is that this is a reason why one of our goals as system engineers and system designers is to create as even level profile across the listening space as possible. It's very easy to, if I stack a speaker in the front of the room, it's very easy to have 18, 24 dB of level difference across the entire listening area. And so even though you might have the same response across the entire listening area, if it's 18 dB louder down front, it's not gonna sound the same to the listeners. So in sort of to be our, our sound communists, right? We want everybody to have the same response. One of our goals is gonna be getting a design that gets as even a level profile as we go across all this. Now. There are nonlinearities in our systems, the harmonic distortion, stuff that's actually audible. The thing I'll tell you, though, is that's not going to show up in your measurement. Our measurement is really so sensitive to gross nonlinearities. Little tiny bits of, of nonlinearities, if you're in the right listening conditions, they're audible, but they're just not going to show up in this measurement. Um, so, yes, our systems, there's a lot of work done by fantastic um, uh, loudspeaker designers and, and driver designers that have reduced the nonlinearities in their components and it's paid off in the sonic quality. You're not going to see this in the measurement. Well, you will, but there are so many other variables that are going to impact the measurement that have a much more pronounced effect that it will be hard to isolate it unless you go into a laboratory conditions to, to do it. And so we can get on, we can talk about that a bit later. 
Um, and by later, I mean weeks from now because I really want to focus on the material at hand. Um, but that's the, the, the thing about this is that we're assuming that our systems are linear. This is a powerful thing, though, because um, then if we can measure at a low level. We don't have to be measuring at an ear bleeding level to, uh, to get a good measurement. And if you, don't, if you don't believe it, go ahead and we'll do some measurements where we'll measure the system at a low level, we'll measure it at a high level, and we'll see if we, it is a linear system. Okay, so one of the other things is as soon as, if we're measuring a piece of electronic equipment, um, any system we measure is going to have noise. But with electronic equipment, that noise is way, way down. It doesn't really mess with us. Um, however, as soon as we open up a microphone, we're going to get, there's going to be some amount of noise in our measurement. And oftentimes it's a significant amount of noise. And so here's the cool thing about that noise. That noise is, is statistically uncorrelated with your reference signal that you're sending through the system, which means that it's randomized in magnitude and phase. And so every time you take a measurement, that noise is just as likely to add as it is to subtract at any frequency. And so what we're going to do, what we learned on this old house, right? Measure twice, cut once. And so what we're going to do is instead of just measuring once, we'll measure repeated times and average our measurements together. And so what we're going to get, averaging is going to, as in a data concept, is going to allow us to focus on what's consistent and reject what's inconsistent. So the noise will statistically, as we double the amount of data we average together, we'll get statistically about 3 dB in a perfect world, massless and extensible ropes and frictionless planes. Woo. But um, we're going to get... Uh, Every time we double the amount of data we average together, we're going to get 3 dB more suppression of noise. And so one of the biggest problems that people have when they're doing their measurements, transfer function measurements, is just not averaging enough. The thing is, we're making, this, we're making an assumption. This is kind of a bold assumption. But our assumption is the system that we're measuring has a measurable response. And that, that's a pretty bold statement. What we're trying to do is uncover the response of the system so that we can use that information to fix our system, redesign our system, whatever we're going to do. Um, and so if we've got noise in the environment, averaging is going to help suppress the effect of noise and give us a closer idea of that, that uh, response to the system. And so what we see here in our averager, up at the top, no averages. You always need to average your transfer function. If you're averaging a, a digital signal, we'll end up doing, we'll end up doing this um, later on. Um, it will measure a DSP when we start talking about phase. Um, I use that for my examples. Um, we'll, we'll drop the averager down because the more averaging you do, the less um, responsive your measurement gets. Um, so the more stable your measurement gets. But if we're measuring electronics and we're making changes, I'd love to see those, those changes um, as quickly as possible. And because we're in a low noise environment, we're not too worried about being susceptible to noise. As we get back into the acoustical environment, the, norm, the real world where we've got noise going on, um, the thing that we want is that we want to increase our averaging. So maybe you're down here in the FIFOs, 8 FIFO, first in, first out, 16 FIFO. Um, as soon as you've got a microphone involved, the minimum you want to be using is one second's worth of integration. I start with three seconds. I like Now here's the thing is we're assuming that this, this system has a measurable response. So that measurable response is in each one of our measurements. So the more data I average together, the more accurate my data is. So uh, you just get improved measurement as you go to higher and higher degrees of averaging. The thing is that, that we're also going to be possibly working with our system and making changes. So we're going to try and do the best of both worlds. We're going to use the V key. V is in Victor. That is the, the flush the averager or reset the averaging buffer. So what we're going to do is we're going to set our averager somewhere around three seconds or more. But if we make a change and we want to see that change appear, instead of waiting for that change to ripple through our averaging buffer, I'll just hit V. And so I can kind of get the best of both worlds. I can get responsiveness by hitting V, but I take my hands off and my data is just getting better and better and more stable. I got to say, one of, the, one of the things when people are capturing lots of data, one of the big mistakes comes in 
where people get data up on the screen and they don't let the averager do its work. They just capture the data right away. Wait a couple seconds and let your data really solidify. This is the way we reject noise. I've got to point out, we're generally not we're not making our measurements under laboratory conditions. We're not in anechoic chambers. Generally, we're generally in the real world, you know, where you've got people making noise and equipment working and all that type of stuff. So your averager is your friend. It's it's there to help improve um, your data. So we're gonna we're gonna when we go for the transfer function measurements, we'll probably start at one second, but we'll increase it to about three seconds a little bit later. Okay, the reason why the averaging setting is on the top level of the interface is because it's something you change in context. So as you need more averaging or less averaging, that's something that's being varied on a regular level. The FFT setting is buried. You have to go in there and find it to change it because you don't need to change it on a regular, a regular basis. You're just going to worry about smoothing and, and averaging. Okay, so now we've got this buffer of measurements. We've got two seconds or one second worth of, of um, measurements. Um, so here's where our friend coherence comes in. So what coherence is going to do is it's going to look at your averaging buffer and it's going to say, how consistent is our data? Right? And so if every time I take a measurement, I get the same answer, that my data is really consistent, it's very coherent. Um, if every time I, time I take a measurement, I get a completely different answer. Remember that, that we're looking at not just magnitude, but we're also looking at phase. So if we've got weird things happening with timing or, or other types of things that will be messing with us, um, that's going to show up in a drop in coherence. And so the, the coherence is graphed. It gives you a number between 0 and 1, or 0 and 100 percent. It's the red trace. It's graphed on the top of the magnitude window. So he's shows up his graph from the, its scale is right here on the right hand side of the magnitude graph and it goes from zero down here to 100 percent up there where 100 percent is great zero sucks okay and so it, all it's doing is it's looking at that averaging buffer if you do not have a coherence trace on your screen smart has either forgot to draw that will probably hit a, on a that's just a little bug if you don't see a coherence trace uh, click on your measurement just to remind Smart to draw it. Sometimes it gets conf confused. We'll probably see this in the, the rest of the demos that I'm going to be doing next week. Um, but if there's no coherence trace, you've either hit the C key, which hides or shows the coherence trace, always show the coherence trace, um, or you're not averaging. So you should always be averaging. You can't. Coherence is looking at the stability of your data so if you only have one piece of data in your averager, it's like one hand clapping, right? You, you, can't, there's no, you can't find variance in one piece of data. Okay, so um, what coherence is gonna just say is, is my data stable, is it not stable? Now, there are three basic causes of a drop in coherence. Um, oh, one last thing. Um, right over here, there's a little threshold indicator on the right hand of the magnitude plot. That is the coherence blanking threshold. All it's there to do is hide data on the screen that's below a certain threshold. There's no right or wrong here. The more averaging you can do, the more you can trust data of lower coherence, but it's just a way of cleaning up the screen. I know that this, the data that was down here at 31 cycles was crap because I, we weren't, the system wasn't re reproducing down there. Um, and so I was just hiding it from the screen off the screen. So it's just a way of cleaning it up for you. The data is still there. When you capture the data, it, that will be in your capture, but it's just a way of cleaning up the screen. So we'll probably use that in a couple different ways coming up. So, okay, what causes a drop in coherence? Well, one is you're an idiot or your system, you have systemic failure or something's going wrong, something's messed up. Um, literally, this is the only place in SMART that kind of, as your wingman, slap you on the back of the head and say, fix your measurement. Um, here, uh, the bottom end of the system wasn't on, so obviously the coherence has come crashing down up here. This is the classic one, um, is I didn't set my measurement delay. And since I didn't set my measurement delay, you're going to see the, the coherence come crashing down. Why does it come crashing down in the highest frequencies first? because in that FFT up at the top, that's got the shortest time constant. So 
being off by a few milliseconds matters a lot to the highest FFT. As we go down, it matters less and less as we go down. So we're going to see this impact. One of the first things we're going to do is we're going to look at our coherence trace and say, do we have decent coherence measurement up in the top end? We can right away sniff out if we haven't set our delay right. Also, these are the things where your coherence is terrible. It's going to, it's going to tell you to check your measurement. Sometimes you're taking measurements and you can't see your microphones. Maybe somebody's unplugged your microphone, or maybe it's fallen down and rolled underneath a chair. So this is a quick indication of saying, hey, check your measurement before just stumbling along. Um, sometimes you'll be taking a measurement if you're using multiple mics, where you've got a couple mics out, and you think you're on the microphone that's, I don't know, five feet away from the, the loudspeaker, but you're actually on a microphone at the back of the room, you know, 100 feet away from the, the microphone. The coherence, you would expect up close and personal would be very good coherence. So if the coherence is terrible, check your measurement. So first thing, bad coherence is I'm messing up my measurement, check your measurement. The second cause for a drop in coherence is just going to be noise, noise contaminating our measurement. Um, the thing that you're going to see with noise is that the, the coherence trace is not going to stabilize and it's going to be a, kind of a range of noise unless the noise happens to be sine waves. Um, which would be really annoying noise, but um, what you're going to see is sort of a band of frequencies coming down. And this is how we can tell if we're measuring loud enough to get an accurate, accurate measurement, because what we're going to do is we're going to take our measurement level and we're going to bring up our measurement level. As we bring up our measurement level, if the coherence gets better with measurement level, it means we're overcoming, we're overcoming uh, noise in the environment. Now you're going to get to a point where you're bringing up the level that you're measuring at and all of a sudden it does, the coherence doesn't get any better. That means we're, we've got good enough signal to noise and then we the last guy is going to be reflections, direct to reverber ratio. Now reflections end up showing up in and, and uh, stuff that's being caused by reverberant energy ends up looking more like stalactites, very sharp dropouts next to high coherence next to low coherence. So that's a really good classic view. This is not, this guy right here is not saying, hey, this is a bad measurement. This could be just a good measurement of a challenging acoustic space. You go into a concert halls, concert halls are built for reverberation. And so there's going to be a lot of it. So you're going to have a lot of what we call blood on the screen there. You're going to see a lot of red up here. Um, but you're going to see high coherence next to low coherence. So it's it's basically, that's what re reverb is going to look like. And the thing is, I can bring up and down the measurement level. It's not going to get better or worse because I can't change direct reverb ratio by turning up or down the system level. Okay, so let's bring this all together then. So those three things are, are kind of affecting our measurement. First thing, bad coherence, check your measurement. Um, but here's a big question. I ask this in all my classes is, let's say I'm sitting in a room, I'm sitting 100 feet away from my main system, or I'm sitting 30 meters from my main system. Um, and then also where I'm sitting, I have another system that's 10 feet away or three meters away from me. So I measure the main system, I measure the, the closed system, and let's say I get the exact same magnitude response, So and I get them to be the exact same level, um, so the, the, I have a system farther away, I have a system close, I've got them so that they have the same magnitude response, and I have them at the same basic level where I'm measuring from. I always ask people, do those two sound systems sound the same? Do the system at the front of the room compared to the system uh, near to me, do they sound the same? And I think everybody reflexively says no. Now, I, was, I, I joke around and say, no, no, is he smart saying they sound the same, right? Because we match the magnitude response trace, right? But you know for a fact that if I listen to voice coming out of the main system, I listen to voice coming out of the near system, the system that's closer to me is going to be more intelligible, whereas the system that's farther away is going to be, it's going to be less intelligible. Um, so the question is, where is that information? And the answer is the coherence trace. So think about it. What affects the coherence trace? Signal and noise and direct reverb. Now, this is the reason why we use our multi-time window, why we prefer multi-time window, is not necessarily for this magnitude trace. There's a bunch of ways we can get that magnitude trace. But 
the predominant reason why we're, we're using multi-time window or why we kept to multi-time window is because multi-time window makes our measurement more and more sensitive to out-of-time information as we go up, much like our listening mechanism does. And so when I add in a delay system, right, when I, I'm back in the room and I've got this system near to me and I'm using it as a delay system, Oftentimes, I'll end up with the same basic curve in the magnitude response, okay? It's, we've got some really great sound systems out there that can throw 4K energy to the back of the room, right? It's, that's not the question. We're, not, we're responsible not only for the tonality of the system, level of the system, but we're also responsible for intelligibility. One of our major jobs is somebody being able to come in, speak through a sound system, and be understood by the people listening to it. And so the thing is that the coherence trace is indicating the transmission quality. So when I add in that delay system, what I hope to see is the coherence get better, which is the whole point of having that delay system. My main system can throw as much 4K as you want to the back of the room, but the quality of it is by the time they gets into the back of the space might not give me good intelligibility. This is like, I burnt your food, but I gave you extra. It's not just quantity, it's quality. We're responsible for that. So the coherence trace is going to be the indicator of transmission quality and intelligibility. And so all these things, we're gonna bring in phase to it uh, next week and talk about the timing stuff, but the, the magnitude trace is telling us about tonality. The coherence trace is telling us about transmission quality, and it's also warning if you messing up your measurement. It's a good little warning system there. Okay, so we're going to spend the time uh, next week. We're going to go through a bunch of example measurements, and I want to demonstrate a bunch of stuff for you. And, and like I said, it might be worth getting a, a, a measurement set up that kind of looks like what we've got here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up today um, with we're going to we're going to build a a transfer function measurement, and so what I'm going to do is the I'm going to get we need to choose a reference signal or it goes into signal, and it comes out a signal or a measurement signal. And so what we're going to be using is the output of the console as our reference signal. So that's going to be that will be our reference signal, and then the microphone is going to be our measurement signal. And so we're going to compare the measurement signal to the reference signal. Now, why am I doing this? Well, my mixer right here is we're going to assume that that's just creating the signal we want to send through the system. It could be a mix of stuff. It could be whatever art's being created. All I'm saying is whatever comes out of that mixer, I'm going to grab that and see how well and how long did it take for it to get that to the microphone at the listening position. Right, And so what we're going to do here, I'll jump back over into our, our setup here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new tab here. So new tab, I'm going to create this. And I'm going to call this guy TF tab. Right, And so right now we don't have any measurements in the tab. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to t tell it to give me a new transfer function measurement. I got there. Uh, by hitting Command T or or there's a new TF button down here, but it's saying, okay, what's the name of this? And I'm going to call this um, Mike versus Mix out. It's going to be the name of my transfer function. My measurement channel is going to be Mike one. My reference channel is going to be Mix out. I hit OK. Now an interesting thing that Smart just did is that Smart, when it was creating this group, when I uh, go over and look at the group setup, when I create this transfer function measurement in this tab, it also put a spectrum measurement of each of the signals that I'm using in that tab as well. That's going to allow me to go and look at those signals and just verify that I'm getting the signals, that, the, the right signals. So if I go ahead and I, I turn on noise here, um, and there's the low frequency. And so if I look at this, um, now what I'm going to do here <laughs> is I'm going to go to 48 uh, averaging. I'll go back and go to bar view, apply, um, hit this guy and go.
expand that vertical scale, move them down. So right there, I had, I saw that I had my reference signal, which was pink. It was pink noise. That's a little cool thing for it to do is color my pink noise pink. So we've got the mix out and the microphone. So that's what we're going to go to. We're going to start with that measurement when we get back into things um, uh, on the next uh, episode. Uh, we're at five. So it'll be episode seven because it's going to be Monday of next week. Okay, so thank you for sitting through this PowerPoint mania. Um, what do you got for questions? And no questions about phase, because <laughs> we're not there yet. <laughs> no, we have a couple of really good questions. Um, one is, uh, and I know we covered this, but I think it's important to reiterate, someone asked, do we have to use pink noise for this? Nope, it's just easier. Now there, yeah, basically it, it's easier. It's an easier signal to measure with just because it doesn't have a high dynamic. I'll, I'll show you, we'll measure with music on uh, the next session just to prove that. Again, don't believe a word I say. That the whole reason why you own an analyzer is so you don't have to take my word for it um, or your own ears word for it because our ears can be, <laughs> we can learn not to trust our ears as well. So it's a good objective measure. So we're going to answer that question, but we'll, we'll measure with, we'll measure with music. We'll measure with noise. It's just a good efficient signal to measure with. And I use it for listening to, but that's uh but the answer is no. You can measure with whatever's going through the sound system. So is the measurement signal always a mic in the room? Another no. good question. No, um, but when you when it comes down to it, I could, if I'm going to, when we're going to measure the DSP later on, the measurement signal is going to be the DSP out signal that I have. So to measure the DSP, I could compare the mix out to the DSP out that's going to be a purely electronic measurement. What's really cool is I can be measuring that even though the rest of the sound system is going on, I've isolated the system. If I can grab its input signal, its output signal, I can just compare those two and get a measurement. Let's say I come in. Now I tend to use as my reference, I tend to use the mix out. I'm afraid of mixers. There's so much stuff that goes on in the mixers. I figure that's the, the mix engineers realm for creating what magic and art they create. Don't tell mixers I call them artists, though, that they get a big head. But basically, there's all sorts of stuff, though, in the mixers nowadays. There's layers and layers of stuff. And I just prefer to say, OK, whatever comes out of that, I'm going to look how well it was reproduced by the sound system at the measurement positions. I will, however, um, one of the reasons why we've looped the signal back in um, to smart, so we have the signal generator loop back is so that I could measure the response of the mixer. So I could, by comparing this signal that's going into the mixer to the signal coming out, I could measure the mixer and I could isolate that and I could find out how that, that guy is working as a device. So it's really, it's all about getting the input to the output. There are, you can measure with an amplifier, you can measure uh, the response of an amplifier. Be careful though, because the level of the signal coming out, you need to have that uh, shunted. You need to have, you need to make sure that you're not taking the the line level coming out of an amplifier and just sticking it back into your I/O device, which, unsuspecting I/O device that wants to see a volt and you're jamming in, you know, 20. So, um, it, so just be aware of the levels of the signals. When we we're gonna go talking about. Um, the smart rig and what goes into a smart rig and part of the smart rig is just about having the cables adapters and what's required to access those signals um, this could be a y cable um, the way that we're we're actually grabbing this signal off of dante so this this is a a digital signal so we're grabbing that um, with some with some consoles you have an output that could be driving your system, but it might be paralleled with another output, like a quarter inch jack. So you could use that to feed smart. So there's like a built-in Y cable in the console. So uh, we can discuss that a bit more when we get later on, much later on in the, in the class. We're gonna get to practical stuff in a couple weeks. <laughs> so bear with us, please. And just real quick, uh, a couple of people noticed the checkbox setting for squared coherence and they're curious what that does. Okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, see if, so there, squared coherence is, um, so 
we've got it uh, a, a linear view of it. Basically, um, when you're showing when you're showing coherence, um, when you have little changes in coherence, like the same thing the same thing with the logarithmic scale on on impulse response, right? When we go to the log scale, we can really see little small reflections and stuff that's lower down in level. When you go to the squared coherence, you can see small variations in coherence, particularly at the either the extremes, either close to zero or close to 100%, they get amplified, so they're much more visible. And so part of this comes um, in when you're looking at using the coherence trace for measuring electronics, where you want to see the impact of distortion in electronics or in your system where you're doing maximum, like using M, M noise, to do test maximum output level. If you don't know what M noise is, Meyer and uh, is doing a bunch of has a bunch of videos out there that can walk you through it. But one of the things they're doing is they're looking at the the coherence trace and looking to see when that coherence trace starts dropping due to distortion in the system. And so the the squared coherence, it's the same information. It's just the with that with that that uh, that squared coherence the first couple dB of drops in coherence is just much more amplified, so it's much more visible. So, and the, the SIM analyzer uses squared coherence. We, we were using uh, linear, so. I'm not sure if that was a good answer, but that's what it's, it's there for. It will, in general, when you're reading the, when you're reading the, the display, and um, actually when we get into measurements on Monday, when we go through the measurements, um, just somebody poke in and remind me and I will, I will switch between the two so you can see it. That's one of the, the, the cool things that you have an analyzer. You can just change the way you look at things and see how it changes. So I think Any that's other? it. Uh, a couple of people asking as usual, where can they find the materials? And uh, those will be posted at rationalacoustics.com slash webinars. I think that Liz is, Liz is standing by to post the, the, this PowerPoint. Um, yeah. Yep. And uh, also people asking, you know, can they watch this again? Yes, these are all collected <laughs> on our YouTube YouTube Sorry. channel. So only just... one viewing per customer. <laughs> yeah. That's that's it's there so that you can review, go back over it and over and over, and then send us questions at support at Rational Acoustics or or write Michael directly. He'd he'd like that. I'll give you his cell phone if you want. So, no, okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out. Everybody stay safe.